that was stationed in Srebrenica and simply couldn't or wouldn't uh, protect civ the civilians. So, um, compassion fatigue. And according, according to the compassion fatigue uh, thesis, when reports on and images of atrocities become abandoned, they do not produce a greater level of awareness, but they rather produce a certain numbness. When people feel bombarded with horrific images and reports, they seal themselves, they seal themselves off in a way. When people feel saturated with horror, they cannot respond compassionately and morally to that horror. This is, in a nutshell, the compassion, the thesis uh, um, that, um, that lies behind this notion of compassion fatigue. So if we follow the logic of the compassion fatigue thesis, it turns out that witnessing is both based on a fiction and is self-defeating. Why? Because we know that, as I mean, that was the, 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 the point of departure for uh, our entire discussion, witnessing is a major thing today in the domain of human rights and humanitarian activist, activism, and indeed, Witnessing um, became much more widespread since the 1970s, and I will speak about the history of witnessing later on. So, in that sense, the fact that witnessing to distant atrocities has become more wi widespread, that so many organizations and individuals saw it as their duty to bear witness to human rights abuses, this process actually created a flood of information and a stimuli overload, which actually alienated the public and prevented it from playing an active, an active part in human rights activism. So witnessing had an inverse effect. So I just want to say that there are ongoing discussions in the, research under, in the research literature on whether or not compassion fatigue describes a real process. After all, we are familiar with cases in which reports on and images of disasters and atrocities triggered a wave of public sympathy, a wave of public support. Just think, uh, for example, on the tsunami in Southeast Asia, which triggered an unprecedented uh, wave of public interest. So I, I personally believe that there is room to question the um, universal validity of the uh, compassion fatigue thesis. But I also think that if we add compassion fatigue or claims uh, about it to what Tom Keenan describes about the baseless conviction in uh, the power of, of the camera, if we add those two together, then there is indeed room to question the general and almost automatic endorsement of witnessing as a human rights and humanitarian practice. So I just want to end this part of the discussion by saying that both Tom Keenan's piece that I asked you to read and uh, the film A Cry from the Grave that I asked you to watch portrayed a commitment to bear witness as somewhat absurd. But I would like to suggest that the lesson of Bosnia is not that witnessing is useless. And it is not that witnessing should be abandoned altogether. The lesson of Bosnia in my mind is rather that human rights and humanitarian activists <coughs> should find ways to bear witness to atrocities that go beyond the production and dissemination of certified facts. 
In my mind, Bosnia teaches us that witnessing should be approached more critically. It teaches us that it is important for activists to call the fictions of witnessing into question and to admit the limitations of their own practices. And Bosnia also teaches us that witnessing should be viewed more as a strategy than as a moral obligation. That witnessing should be regarded as one of the instruments in the toolkit of human rights and humanitarian work, but not necessarily as a practice that vouches for the, for the morality of the entire enterprise. So I'm happy to take questions before we continue to the next part, which will deal more, uh, which will deal with the history of uh, contemporary witnessing. Questions? Yes, please. I even think Could that. You repeat the question so they can talk yes. About it? Uh, the question was if compassion fatigue can also apply to individual aid workers or activists, right? Um, I even think that this is where this concept had originated um, that, uh, uh, that the notion of compassion fatigue emerged in, in a kind of a psychological literature on how people were confronted with suffering on a regular basis, react or fail to react to that suffering? So the question is yes, definitely. The answer is yes, definitely, yeah. What was the name of the movie again? The name of the movie? It's on your syllabus, I think. No, I just posted it on, 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 online. Okay. <laughs> okay, A Cry from the Grave. It is a film that was produced by the BBC, if I'm not mistaken. You can watch it um, online. There's a link now on, on your okay. It's in six parts, which doesn't make it very convenient, but it is possible to watch it online. And do watch it. It's a fascinating film. Yes, please. Uh, do you have a majority of humanitarian actors view witnessing as a moral obligation? Well, the question was, do the majority of human rights activists view witnessing as a moral obligation? Well, I wouldn't know what's the right way to measure it. Um, I mean, there might be a way to conduct some kind of a poll. I mean, but so I can't give any mathematically accurate response to your question. But I think that it is safe to say that witnessing is very prominent in human rights discourse and is very prominent in the kind of discourse that activists develop to describe their own practices, their own challenges, the, own, the, the ways that they developed in order to deal with uh, the kind of political reality in which they operate. So, well, I guess, I thought maybe one way to look at that would be is there a lot of condemnation of uh, Red Cross Association because they don't witness? That's where we're heading. Okay. okay. Okay, what can be, how can witnessing, uh, is there any other way to, um, to witness that in a way that will not lead to compassion fatigue? That was the question. Um, well, as I will try to say towards the end of my talk, there is a way to bring compassion fatigue into account while, uh, while preserving witnessing as a kind of a framework uh, of human rights practice, human rights and humanitarian practice. Um, and I guess the answer to your question would be that first, the assumption that more information, more reports, um, more images are essentially a good thing, this assumption should be called into question. That's, I mean, first of all, there needs to be some kind of uh, self-critique and reflexivity in the way that human rights and humanitarian approach their own practices of representation. And then I think the second thing is to be able to develop creative ways to, um, 
make distant suffering, distant cases of emergencies more publicly known. And actually, some organizations have been engaged with that kind of uh, creative rethinking of their own practices of witnessing. And we'll also allude to that uh, later on. This will be the one last question, and then we will proceed. Yes, please. Um, sort of a follow-up to the last question, but also for good reasons clarification. If your argument is to eliminate moral obligations and motivations for witnessing, sort of to prevent like compassion fatigue for the public as a whole, like if organizations aren't using this as their own personal motivation, then maybe it won't translate in the same way to the public. Okay, let me. Okay. Let me elucidate my, uh, my previous answer to the, pre to the previous question. I don't think that compassion fatigue can be dealt with with any mechanical way. Okay? I don't think that there is a magic solution to compassion fatigue. And by the way, as I said, I'm not sure that, com that compassion fatigue is that much of a problem. Okay? Just please remember that. The only thing I, th I think that humanitarian activists and human rights activists can do is to perpetually question their own practices. Never stay in one place. Never do things that, that never do things that ju just because they are used to do them in a certain way. Okay, that's so. It's not. It's not very. Uh, there is no recipe <coughs> on how to prevent compassion fatigue. There is no recipe on how to respond to uh, distant uh, atrocities. The only way I think that um, can make humanitarian practices and human rights practices more ethically consistent is to exercise some kind of a self-critic and reflexivity. So let's continue now to the second part of the lecture in which uh, I want to speak uh, on the history of contemporary humanitarian witnessing. So as you probably know, the roots of humanitarian witnessing go back to the 18th century. It was in that period known as the Enlightenment, that we see forging a new conviction in the power of knowledge in general and of stories, true stories in particular, to bring about social change. And it is also in that period that we see emerging new ways to talk about social suffering and to depict social, social suffering. <coughs> So in other words, what I'm saying is that the, the, the uh, documentation and even the denunciation of what is perceived as evitable suffering are not new phenomena. They are not contemporary phenomena. And yet, something new happens in the late 1960s. Because around that period, aid workers and activists began to thematize those erstwhile, erstwhile practices of documentation, reporting, and denunciation as acts of witnessing. It is only more or less around this period that activists start to explicitly refer to bearing witness as one of their major tasks and obligations. So in the rest of our discussion, I would like to trace the history of bearing witness as a moral obligation. And I would like to ask, while the self-identification of aid workers as witnesses 